Hello, everyone. Today's talk will be about measuring signal complexity or regularity or irregularity. So the approaches that we are going to talk about today have been heavily utilized in analyzing time series data, specifically physiological time series data like EEG, EMG, heart rate variability, and ECG signals, basically. These approaches can be applied on any kind of signals or time series data. And there are numerous like approaches or measures that we can look at, but we have picked up for today, approximate entropy, sample entropy, fuzzy entropy, distribution entropy, and permutation entropy. They all have some sort of commonality and we thought about exploring that commonality to help people understand the concept behind these measures. So let's start. Entropy as it relates to dynamical system, as we know from our previous videos, it's a rate of information production. So in a previous video, we defined entropy as a measure of uncertainty associated with a random variable. And we said uncertainty is also linked to information. So the more uncertain you are, the less information you have. And the less uncertain you are, the more information you have. So keep in mind, that uncertainty and information are related and we define uncertainty as a manifestation of some information deficiency, while information is defined as the capacity to reduce uncertainty. So the concepts that we are looking at today specifically include information, uncertainty, and entropy. And entropy can also be defined as a measure of chaos. So entropy measures, the nonlinear property of many signals, including um, those from human body like EEG, EMG, ECG, and others, have attracted increasing attention nowadays since nonlinearity is believed to be inherent in physiological processes. So, as I mentioned, we are going to look at a number of these entropy measures, starting with the approximate entropy, and we will show you how understanding one of these can help you understand the remaining. These measures are usually favored since they can provide estimation of complexity. So whenever you see approximate entropy or sample entropy being utilized with signals like EEG, EMG, people usually um, note the um, term of complexity. These measures have been heavily utilized as feature extraction techniques. So you will find them a lot in the recent liter literature specifically. So um, approximate entropy it was uh, actually initially introduced by Pincus, who introduced the method as a set of measure for system complexity or a measure of regularity. So basically, we try to look at the time series data or a signal in general and try to quantify how regular or how chaotic is that time series. Can we actually provide one number for that time series that tell me how regular or irregular, how predictable that time series can be or how chaotic that time signal can be. So this is a measure of high importance, especially like for example, in the studies of EEG signal analysis from the brain or in finance time series data analysis, where you need to know what sort of measures are more chaotic or repeatable than other, like let's say stock signals, for example. So the method of approximate entropy, it exam, examines the um, time series for similar epochs. What does that mean? So it's an approach that helps us to report on similarity in a time series, as we will see in the next few slides. So let's dive in deeper. In a nutshell, what we are going to do today, we are going to explore or do some sort of template matching. So we are going to pick some sort of template and we are going to see how repeatable is that template across my entire time series. So all what you have to do to start this scan kind of analysis is to select a template of length of endpoints. So select your template. And over here, my template is showing to you in the pink color. And I'm looking to see if these two circles are actually the pattern of these two circles is repeatable and how often it's repeatable in my time series. If you identify other templates that are arbitrarily similar across the entire time series and determine which of these remain arbitrarily similar for the next M plus one points, then you have actually calculated approximate entropy. 
So basically, what we are trying to say, if a signal is completely repeatable or regular, imagine like a sine wave, and you are looking at a pattern made of endpoints. So if it's a sine wave, it repeats itself every what? Every um, T, which is the period of the signal usually. So in that case, it doesn't matter if I have M points or M plus one points. So the signal is still going to be repeatable. But we, what we do, we pick up two templates actually, one of size M and one of size M plus one. So I can build a probability measure out of these and then see how repeatable is that measure. So arbitrarily similar over here means that the points are within a tolerance of each other. So when you say, I want to see how repeatable is that pattern, you have to have some sort of similarity measure and you have to have some sort of threshold on the generated um, similarity or distances based on the similarity measure. So again, you are going to pick a template of endpoints. You are going to move that template across your time series to find matches. And by matches, we mean calculate the distance between your template and the portion of the signal that you are comparing against. And then you need to compare that generated distance with some sort of threshold, which is R, defined as the parameter R over here, which is by itself a portion of the standard deviation of the signal. Let's dive in deeper to make it easier. So before we continue, I just need to bring to your attention that you have three parameters to worry about, which is the template length, how big is the template that you want to look for in your time series or signal is? What's the tolerance rate that our parameter that we talked about, the threshold? And what is the time delay? So let's have a look at more details about these parameters. Imagine a time series, as you can see over here. This is made of n samples. So what I've done over here, I have like included a set of squares or rectangles with different colors. I don't want to put values and give you numbers, so I'll try to make it more intuitive. The first step we do in this sort of analysis is to look at something called the embedding dimension, which is related to the template size that we are going to pick. So let's explain. What does that mean? If Imagine that um, you are selecting a template of size of two, two samples. So you want to pick a template of size two samples. So for every two samples in your time series, you want to see how many times did that template repeat itself, or there were other instances or portions in your signal that were very similar to that template. In the example that I show you over here, if you notice that the first two samples, for example, the red and the blue have repeated themselves over here. So this is the red and the blue, which is exactly the same value. Now, the question is, how many times does it repeat itself? Well, obviously, it repeats itself one time over here. And if you continue the time series, there may be more. But within the portion, the small portion that I'm looking at, it repeated itself one time. So what is this embedding dimension all about? Let's have a look at it. The idea over here is very similar to the idea of sliding window approach. So you have to, because you're like, basically, you are analyzing a time series. So you have to have a specific window size, which is the amount of the, let's say, data that you are going to look at. And then what you need is to slide that window across your entire, entire time series. Just like you do when you do convolution, you know, where you slide one signal or one portion by the other signal. So this is kind of similar approach. But what we do usually here, we do some sort of embedding. So what does embedding do exactly? What I'm going to do, is that I'm going to pick all of these rectangles or squares with their specific colors, and I'm going to line them up, as you see over here. So by lining them up, you can see that there is the red, blue, black, orange, yellow, and I exactly took them from here, red, blue, black, orange, yellow, and so on. I continued. I just brought all of these rectangles or squares. I lined them up over here as one column, then I bring another version because we said the embedding dimension or the template length that I'm interested to look for is two points. So I need to create another dimension. How do I create the other dimension? It's simply made by the same column shifted up by one value. So you can see that 
the next column over here it starts from the blue black orange yellow and so on for the remaining colors of course i will have an empty value over here which will be replaced by nan not a number for the remaining of the analysis so when someone tell you embedding dimension don't get scared about embedding dimension the whole idea is that you are going to look at the window of size two so the window size is two samples you place the first two samples as the first row then you move the window by one sample and the next two samples are actually placed in the second row move the window further by one sample and the next two samples are placed in the third row fourth row and as you can see all what you're doing with the trick of embedding dimension is no more than just a sliding window approach so basically what we are trying to do is that give me all the samples that I would have if I slide a window across my time series and line them up as two columns. So that's the embedding dimension of two. That's what we mean by embedding dimension. So continue the analysis. As you can see, we are just picking up these samples and up until the end of the signal. And eventually you might have one sample and the Next value over here will be a none because you don't have any more values after that. So you can stop over here actually. Now, if we continue this sort of analysis, I can similarly generate an embedding dimension of three in the same exact way. So in this case, what I'm trying to say, my window size is three, not two anymore. And in this case, it's like imagining a window size of three. So you have red, blue, black, that's red, blue, black. And then you start shifting. It will, the next one will be blue, black, orange. So blue, black, orange, and so on. And that's an embedding dimension of three. So why do I need to create two set of embedded dimensions? Well, because the whole idea of approximate entropy is that if a signal repeats itself, when you have like a certain template of size two, and the signal is completely predictable. So the idea is that you can still predict the signal, even if you go for a, like, let's say, slightly bigger window size, which is usually M plus one points, which is the three points. So that's the idea of approximate entropy. So how do we calculate the distances? Like we talked about distances. Up until now, you know that we have to use an approach to calculate an embedding dimension of size M and an embedding dimension of size M plus one. So for two points, embedding dimension, as we said, what we do next to apply, continue with the calculation of the approximate entropy, we said we are going to bring all of these points, line them up, okay, as rows or columns, like however you wanna think about it. Then what you do, you are going to look at the distance between the first row and the second row, distance between the first row and the third row, distance between the first row and the fourth row and so on until the next or the last, sorry, row. In the same way, you will calculate the distance between the second and all the remaining rows, the distance between the third and all the remaining rows and so on. So what you are doing over here in like in reality, you are actually building a distance matrix. So imagine an example, as I show you over here, there's the row data. It has a number of rows that go from like A, B, C, D, E, F across two columns. So if you want to build the distance matrix, so the distance matrix over here, it will be size what? Six by six. So A, B, C, D, E, F and the distance between A and A, which is zero, distance between A and B, A and C, A and D, A and E and A and F and so on for the remaining cases. So what you do basically, you are taking the distance between the first row all the other rows, second row, all the other rows, third row, all the other rows, and so on. So as an example, I show you over here the calculation of the value of 16, where we get it from. So that will be basically 24 minus 9 squared plus 54 minus 49 squared, and the entire portion or the entire value is like a square root on that, which is 16 almost. And that's how you calculate this distance matrix. Now, because this distance matrix is symmetric, so the upper portion of the matrix is exactly replicated in the lower portion of the matrix, you don't need the entire matrix. 
you can survive with just looking at one portion, either the upper triangle or the lower triangle. So again, we started by looking at the time series. We picked up an embedding dimension, which is m equal to. We lined up the values as two columns or a bunch of rows, and then we started calculating the distance. Why do we do that? Because I want to see for every possible potential template of two samples, how much similarity or how many segments of my time series look like that template for every single template of two potential of two possible samples. And that's the whole idea. So line them up as a bunch of rows or columns, as you see over here on the left, and then start calculating the distance between every row and all the other rows. Once you have the distance matrix, look at either the upper diagonal or the lower diagonal and reshape it as a vector, distance vector. How easy is that? It's very simple. Now let's continue. Remember, if you are going to program this yourself, in MATLAB, the function that give you these distances as a vector, it's called pdist. In Python, it's scipy.spatial.distance.pdist, or you can use the SK, uh, sklearn metrics pairwise, pairwise distances. It's up to you depending on how you implement it. So again, we are now going to formalize how to calculate the approximate entropy. So we said line up the samples, calculate the distance between every row and all the other rows, as you can see, and then calculate the standard deviation of the signal, which they call usually in the literature as sigma, okay? The distance that you have calculated as we mentioned in the earlier slide, compare it with R, the threshold times of sigma. So because you are comparing in this way, you will end up having a set of binary values, okay? A set of binary values, if the distance is a smaller than threshold, then you get a bunch of zeros. If the distance is not smaller than or equal to the threshold, you're gonna get a one, right? Or the opposite, sorry. So you do the same for the embedding dimension of three. You repeat the whole process again, calculating distances, okay? And you calculate another vector of values. So one case for the embedding dimension of M and one case for the embedding dimension of M plus one, and you compare against the threshold times of sigma. Approximate entropy is then calculated by this equation. So if a signal is completely repeatable, then what happens over here is that the A and B should be kind of like similar values and you will end up having a log of one, which is zero. So the approximate entropy is zero for completely repeatable signals. The more irregular or the more chaotic is the signal, the larger the value of approximate entropy. But remember over here, what you are doing is that you're comparing the distance against the threshold. If it's less than the threshold, you get one. If it's bigger than the threshold, you get zero. That's the whole idea. So by looking at the number of these like ones and zeros, the crisp values that you generated from here, you sum that and you take the log and you end up with the value of approximate entropy. Now, if the data are ordered, then templates that are similar for M points are often similar for M plus one points, which means the conditional probability approaches to one and the negative logarithm um, and like it will end up basically with um, entropy of zero, approaching zero value. Why? Because it will be equivalent kind of values for A and B and will be log of one. Log of one is zero, so the entropy is zero, which means the signal is completely repeatable. Some examples of the application of approximate entropy, as you can see, I took this from this paper, which is approximate entropy as a complexity measure by Steve Pinkos. So this is the heart rate um, signal for like two infant quiet sleep heart rate tracing with uh, similar variability and standard deviation basically. 
And you can see that there is a difference between the approximate value uh, entropy for the two time series that you look at over here. One of them has a value of 0.826, the top one, and the bottom one has an approximate entropy value of 1.463. Another example you can see here, the top one is pretty much close to the sinusoidal and it has lower approximate entropy. As it gets more chaotic, approximate entropy value gets bigger. And as it gets even more chaotic, the approximate entropy value gets even more like bigger, basically. So the more repeatable, the small, the approximate entropy value and the more chaotic or complex than the bigger value of approximate entropy. Now questions. How does one pick up M and R? How do I pick them up? Well, basically, for the template size, you have to try different values. It depends on the time series that you are looking at. So you have to have some sort of understanding of what are you exactly looking for? So the usual suggestion is that M is usually one or two, but it's definitely recommended that you try different values. And remember that the bigger value for M, it will reveal more of the dynamics of the data. And for the, value, uh, for the value of R, the threshold, it's usually recommended that you set it up as 0.2 times standard deviation of the data set. Now, the next question, what if some templates have no matches and the conditional probabilities are not defined? Well, what would happen over there? If there are no matches, conditional probability is going to be one and approximate entropy is going to be zero. Well, isn't that telling us that this is a perfect order? Well, yes, and this is one of the drawbacks or limitations or problem with approximate entropy. If there are no matches, it means A is zero, B is zero. We end up with log one over one, which is log one, which is zero. And you tell me that approximate entropy is zero for the case of a signal with no complete matches. Doesn't that say, didn't we just say in the last slide that this is actually perfect order or completely repeatable signal? Well, this is exactly the problem with approximate entropy. And that's why we have further or other versions of this entropy measure. What if there are only a few matches? Well, if there are only a few matches, then the result is biased towards zero. And the bias resolve with lengthening data sets and more template matches. So um, despite this, the literature still described the bias of APN. And like, like basically the literature studied the bias of approximate entropy and have contended that the important goal of reporting a correct hierarchy of order is preserved. So as you saw, we do have some sort of limitations with approximate entropy. And that's why sample entropy was produced as a modification of approximate entropy which is also used for assessing the complexity of physiological time series signals. So sample entropy has two advantages over approximate entropy. One of them is that the data length independence, and the other one is that um, the comparison between a template vector and the rest of the vector also include a comparison with itself in approximate entropy. Well, over here, um, the like implementation is slightly different, basically. So you remove a bit of the bias. So just like we did for the approximate entropy, we picked up the dimension M and the M plus one, we created the embeddings, calculated the distances, but now instead of comparing the distance with the threshold directly and putting it in the equation, we are putting the sum over here, as you notice. So sample entropy will be what? Minus log A over B. And A and B are the summation of all of these comparisons. But remember, what you are summing up over here is a bunch of ones and zeros because you are doing a logical comparison. So in comparison to the approximate entropy, we didn't have the sum over here. And the approximate entropy was actually plugging these values in this equation and reporting the approximate entropy. So the main difference in the implementation, everything is the same, except when you reach this part, you put a summation over here. It's basically like you took the summation, you brought it here and put it there, and you just take log of n over b. 
while over there in the approximate entropy, you actually lift the individual values and you're doing a value by value comparison. So that's A of I and B of I. Now, sample entropy versus approximate entropy. So again, all what you are doing or trying to do is picking up a template size, picking up a portion of that time series and trying to see how often does that portion repeat itself within the signal. Now, how do I pick up the portion? You don't have to worry about that because every single portion of M samples will be picked up and will be used in the analysis to see how often does it repeat itself. And these are the two equations. So remember for regular repeating data, A, or A over B needs one and the entropy becomes zero, which means the um, completely regular signal should have a value of zero or very close to zero. While for more chaotic signals that don't often repeat itself, you should have a bigger values for these like entropy measures. Here's an example that I picked up from MathWorks file exchange for sample entropy. Look at the three um, signals. The top one is very nice sinusoidal, repeatable. It can it repeat itself every like certain period, which is what based on the um, frequency of the signal. So as you can see, the repeatable signal have a sample entropy of X in um, pinky. It's close to zero, it's actually zero almost. The blue one has a slightly higher value because it still kind of look like the sinusoidal shape, but it's a little bit noisy. And the chaotic signal in orange has the highest sample entropy value, which makes sense. This is exactly what we mentioned. So approximate entropy and sample entropy, all what they tried to do is to give you one value, as you can see over here, that give you an indication of how chaotic or how repeatable is that time series that you are analyzing. Now, the choice of the parameters again, for M, the embedding dimension, so the number of, like if you pick up M to be too large, you have to know that the number of template matches will decrease due to noise from the measurement errors or system interaction. And if you pick it up too small, then the template matches are plentiful, but not enough predictive information is contained in a short template leading to an underestimation of the probability of a forward match. As for the value of R, if you pick it up to be too large, sample entropy loses its discriminating power. And if you pick it up to be too small, you will have like basically um, many vectors that are actually similar, failing to match. Now, we understand the concept behind approximate entropy and why we created some sample entropy. Now we have another version of these entropies. It's called fuzzy entropy. So you remember how we were calculating um, these like distances and comparing them against threshold and summing that? Well, literature, the literature says, well, why do we look at the um, numbers or as a whole concept as very crisp as it's either one or zero? In reality, there's nothing like that, like in real systems, like in terms of physiological signals, it's not gonna be like it's either the, like condition A or condition B, like one or zero. It's usually fuzzy. The value is usually fuzzy in between. And that's exactly what the idea is fuzzy entropy is about. It says instead of comparing the distances against some threshold and generating a bunch of zeros and ones, which are very crisp, let's make that fuzzy. So how do we make it fuzzy? Well, the uh, literature proposed this equation. So all what it does, it says, you know what? Instead of comparing the distance against a threshold, just take the exponential of that distance for all of these distances and the distance vectors and sum them up. And that's how you generate the value of A and B. So look at A, we were comparing against threshold, generating a bunch of ones and zeros and taking the summation of that, no longer do that. Just take the summation of the exponential of these distances, just as another approach. So you can guarantee it's not gonna be a bunch of zeros, but a set of like numbers in between zero and one, which is more fuzzy. And again, so how you calculate it? So here is how you calculate the terms. It's just exponential of the distances. And you do that for the embedding dimension of M and embedding dimension of M plus one 
and you calculate the fuzzy entropy value. So again, it's the same exact concept where you start with, you look at the time series, you pick up a template width or length, and then you um, like prepare the embedding dimension for made of like basically of M points and M plus one points. And then you calculate this equation based on the distances for the first embedding dimension and this one as well. And you divide just like we did with the previous measures. Let's look at another of these entropy measures. This one is called the distribution entropy. Again, a time series, pick a template size M, pick a time delay. And by the way, when I say the time delay, the tau value of one over here, I mean by how much do you shift the window? You, got, you are going to calculate your embedding dimension and you are going to calculate the distances as we mentioned earlier. Now, instead of just summing these distances or comparing them against the threshold, what we do over here in this version of the entropy is that we are going to build a histogram, a histogram based on these distances. How do I build a histogram? So uh, we have discussed this in one of the earlier videos about entropy. And we say, all what you need to do is pick a min and max of these distances and the distance vector you generated, select the number of bins and divide the range, which is the max minus min divided by the number of bins, for example, by 10. You are going to create 10 bins, for example, and then you are going to count how many values from my time series, or sorry, from my distances vector fall within the range of the first bin, how many samples from my distances vector fall within the range of 0.3 and 0.58, just count them and eventually um, divide by the total number of samples that you have there to turn them into probabilities. And once you have done that, what do you have to do? It's a P log P, that's it. Very easy to calculate. But as you can see, they all start from the same place, which is creating an embedding dimension and then calculate it in some sort of distances. Another um, example, if you want to see about um, fuzzy entropy and distribution entropy from this paper, detection of epileptic seizure based on entropy analysis of short-term EEG. So you can see some really nice examples over there and the power of these measures in discriminating between the different um, classes of EEG signals. So the top two that you see in red, they uh, represent EEG data collected from healthy volunteers. And the lower three that you see, the N and F and S, were collected from five epileptic uh, patients. So you can see how with different window length, these measures can actually give you very nice discrimination between these classes of time series. The last one that we are looking at uh, today over here, it's called permutation entropy. So this is a robust time series um, tool which provide quantification measure of the complexity as well. So instead of talking about it, let me dive in and show you how to implement it. Again, time series made of N samples. Assume that this is your time series, just an example basically made of these values. You have to create an embedding dimension again. Let's, for example, assume that I'm going to pick an embedding dimension of three and tau value of one. So window size of three, window increment of one. What you end up having is this matrix. So this time we flipped it because in some part of the literature, that um, embedding dimension matrix is usually flipped to make it horizontal. If you look at the values, what we put over here, so we said we're going to pick a template of three values. Remember, the template of three values will be what? 479, that's 479. Then 7910, because we're shifting by one, and that's your 7910. Then 9106, as you can see, 9106. Then 10611, and then 6113. The next step in the analysis or in the calculation of permutation entropy is mapping into unique permutations. So what does that mean? Um, if you have three numbers, okay, the permutations possible are showing over here or shown over here for you. 
So the potential permutations for this case with the embedding dimension of three is that you can put the smallest number first, then the next small, um, like the bigger one, and then the biggest one at the end. So zero, one, two. The next permutation, like basically we are trying to look at the ordering of the samples. How do I order these three samples? So what is the order? So I know that four is a smaller than seven and seven is a smaller than nine. So what I look basically over here in each of these permutations is what order of these matches my data. So I said, this is the smallest, this is bigger, and this is the biggest. So I look for something that look like that. In this case, I can replace that 479 by the permutation vector made of 0, 1, 2, because 0 is the smallest, 1 is bigger than 0, and 2 is the biggest value over here. So if you do that for every single column, if you apply these permutations on every single column, what you end up having is what? A new matrix. Again, it's made of one, two, three, four, five columns. One, two, three, four, five columns. I'm replacing the first column with the value of zero, one, two, because it matches this permutation. I'm replacing the second column because it's also organized like seven is a smaller than nine and nine is a smaller than zero. So I took the first permutation again, zero, one, two. Over here, nine is a smaller than zero, uh, uh, sorry, than 10, um, but 10 is actually bigger than six. So which permutation matches that? So if you look over here again, uh, it will be, uh, we said we're gonna put one, two, zero. So um, nine is a smaller than 10, but 10 is definitely bigger than six. And that's what we picked up. So this, um, let's say permutation matches the order of these values. So I put one, two, zero, then I have 10, six, 11. And for 10, six, 11, so I'm going to replace that by one, zero, two, and six, 11, three, I'm replacing that by one, two, zero. So basically I have the signal values I created a set of permutations made of three variables or three values. And I looked over here to see which one of these permutations matches the order of the values in the columns and replace them over here. That's all. Continue with the analysis. What you are going to do is that count how many times did the first permutation, this one pi one occur in this matrix. Well, how many times did zero, one, two occur? That's one, that's two. So I have two out of five columns in total. How many times did the second one appear? Never, zero. The third one, how many times did it appear? One, two, zero. It only appeared how many times? Sorry, this one, one, zero, two. One, zero, two, it only appeared one time. So that's one over five. And pi four, which is one, two, zero, it appeared two times. That's one, two, zero, and one, two, zero. So that's two over five. And the remaining permutations occurred zero times, never. Now I have the probabilities. How do you calculate the entropy? Minus summation P log P. That's all, that's a permutation entropy. Why would this be more interesting than the other approaches? Because you are replacing the values with the permutation, um, let's say combinations. So why would that be good? It will be good if your values or readings or the value of the time series are noisy. So in this case, you get rid of the original values and you replace them by something else. So if you want all of these um, entropy measures implemented in MATLAB or Python, there's something called Entropy Hub. It provides you Basically, the base entropies, as you can see over here, it's almost every single entropy that the literature mentions available in Python and MATLAB. Cross entropies, bidimensional entropies, multi-scale entropy functions, and more than that. And by the way, when I say cross entropy, do you know what the difference between a cross entropy and base entropy? So I've presented for you a few of these base entropies, but what does cross entropy mean? Cross entropy is when you have two time series. When you pick a template for one of them and match it across all the portions of the other time series. So it's like you have two, you're comparing two time series against each other. 
some references over here for you to have a look at some very nice papers explaining these concepts. And that was all for today. I hope you learned the differences between what these entropies and what they really represent and how to calculate them. Thank you.